Tai Chi is your typical good-for-nothing high school student who has great athletic abilities. Yet, he's a disgusting lazy nerd who prefers to play video games instead of touching some grass. And for some reason, he has this hella cute childhood friend named Rin, who's been waiting for some years to clap him. She's full of energy, and she's walking to school with Mr. Wasted Potential. They're talking about how Tai Chi doesn't join any school clubs, even though he's really good at sports. Rin thinks it's a shame, but Tai Chi says clubs are too much trouble. While they're talking, a little leaf gets blown by the wind and floats by Tai Chi. He looks at it and then suddenly sees a bike coming right at Rin. Tai Chi acts really fast and pulls her out of the way just in time. Suddenly, a magic circle with some strange symbols shows up under Rin and Tai Chi. They have no idea what's going on. Tai Chi tries to move away from the circle, but it keeps following him. He figures out that he's the one the circle is after, so he tries to push Rin out of the circle to keep her safe. But Rin doesn't want to leave him alone, so she goes back to him as the circle glows and they vanish. Tai Chi opens his eyes seconds later, laying in a grass field. He has already achieved more than most of you. He checks on Rin to make sure she's okay and then wakes her up gently. After making sure they're both fine, they look around and see that they're in a big, green field. It's like they went from the road to nowhere. They try to use their phones, but there's no signal. Rin thinks they should find a house to borrow a phone and call their families because maybe they're just lost. But Tai Chi has this crazy idea. He thinks they might not be in their world anymore. He points out that there was something like a magical circle under them, kind of like what you see in video games. It didn't look special, but he felt like there was some special power coming from it. Rin gets a bit worried because she thinks Tai Chi is talking like a typical geek. She doesn't like how he's jumping to these big conclusions so quickly. Just as they're talking, they both see a mysterious creature. It's like a huge black horse, but with a horn on its head which looks like a black blade. They're totally shocked. Tai Chi's like, we gotta run. As they try to get away, the horse attacks them, charging right at them. Tai Chi's acting is all heroic, telling Rin to hide while he deals with the horse. He's trying to be the big hero and show off. He steps away from Rin and decides to make the horse super mad by throwing a rock at it and saying mean stuff. The horse gets super angry and charges right at him, ready to attack. But guess what? Tai Chi is the main character, so he doesn't get squished by the horse. Out of nowhere, some strange magic slices the horse's neck, and Tai Chi is saved. Then, they see this bald guy with a massive sword. He's the one who hurt the horse, and there's also an archer who was hiding in the bushes. Together, they beat the big, scary horse called an obsidian horse. Then, another person from the group finishes off the obsidian horse with a spell and turns it into a grill. Her name is Magilla and she's a little mage. She tells Requelta, the archer, to take off the horse's horns, but he grumbles and says that Barada, the bald guy with the sword, should do the hard work. While they talk about what to do with the horse, Tai Chi starts thinking. He's pretty sure this isn't their world. It's more like the RPG games he used to play with magic and monsters. That circle thingy teleported them to a whole new world, and it looks way more dangerous and old-fashioned than where they came from. So Tai Chi decides something important. He promises himself that he and Rin have to survive in this strange world, no matter what. Tai Chi and Rin join the group around a small campfire. Requelta is the friendly type and starts talking to them. He wants to know where they're from because they look strange with their school uniforms. Tai Chi doesn't know what to say, so he looks at Rin for help, but she doesn't say anything. Luckily, Barada steps in and tells Requelta not to ask about that stuff because it's private. Magilla agrees with Barada and says they should keep their answers to themselves. But Barada warns them that it's dangerous to travel without weapons in this area. There are lots of mean monsters around here, and they attack anything they see. It's a big problem because they even attack the carts that carry food to the city. So, not only are they hurting regular people, but it's turning into a big problem for everyone. Tai Chi feels scared, but he's also determined. He thinks going to the city is the best thing to do. So, he asks Barada to take them there, and Barada says yes right away. The other two friends agree too, especially Raquelta because he doesn't want to leave Rin alone out here. He's the flirty type. But Barada says he and Rin have to make up before dawn, as Rin is upset with Tai Chi. He waits for a moment when Rin is alone and asks her why she's so mad. Rin isn't really mad, she's just really worried about Tai Chi actions earlier. She didn't want to be left alone in this strange world without her best friend. But they talk it out and decide to stick together from now on. They even do a fist bump to show that they're friends again. 
In Barada's group's cart, they get taken to Aspire, a city in the magical kingdom of Alistane, which is the group's home base. Even though Raquelta warns them about how dangerous their job as adventurers is, Rin and Tai Chi decide they want to stay in the city and become adventurers. As a nice gesture, Barada gives them some money to get started, and he tells them they can find their group at a nearby inn if they need anything. So, Rin and Tai Chi head to the Adventurers Guild. There, a friendly lady, Marie, welcomes them and asks about their race, which confuses Rin. She looks at Tai Chi to answer, but Tai Chi is super surprised because the place looks just like the RPG games he used to play. They identify their race, and the lady gives them a little book with contract stuff in it. Tai Chi is puzzled because the writing looks strange, but to their surprise, they both understand it perfectly. Before finalizing their registration as adventurers, they have to take a magical aptitude test, an important requirement to become adventurers, otherwise, they won't be able to register. Rin is the first to put her hand on the crystal sphere for the magical test, not expecting anything unusual. But then, a weird glow appears inside the sphere, and it startles the lady in charge. She asks Tai Chi to try it too, and although he's a bit unsure, he agrees. But when he touches the sphere, it breaks into pieces. This totally surprises everyone, and now they're feeling all confused and embarrassed, like they messed up big time. Everyone's staring at them. The lady goes away and comes back with some important people, the guild master Gerard and a cool elf named Muller who's a golden fencer. Gerard tells them they can't be adventurers right now, which makes Rin and Tai Chi worry they won't have a job. But then he says they should go with Muller to a different place where they'll get the right advice. They don't have many options, so they have to agree to follow Muller to this new place. When Rin and Tai Chi arrive at their destination, they meet Lemia, a woman who doesn't seem to be shy at all which makes Tai Chi uncomfortable, so Rin makes sure to cover his eyes. After Lemia changes into different clothes that aren't much more modest, they are invited into her home. Muller explains the situation to Lemia because the guild's magic meter couldn't figure out their abilities. Gerard wants Lemia to test them. She brings out a special device, a magic meter she made herself, which is more advanced. They get scanned by it, and weird symbols they can't read pop up. But when Muller looks at the numbers, she's shocked because they are really high. Rin and Tai Chi are confused and don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. They're mostly just interested in finding out if they can become adventurers. Lemia says they can, but there's a catch. They have to be her apprentices from now on. Lemia's talking to them, and it's getting pretty interesting. She says they both have super high levels of power, but they don't even know how to use it right. So, she offers to train them because if they don't learn, their own magic might mess them up. While they're eating, Lemia explains how magic works in this world. People trade with spirits that have powers from fire, water, wind, and earth. In return, they get magic spells, which are like special techniques. Most mages can only use one element, except for some exceptions like Muller, who uses two, and Lemia herself, who uses three. Rin, though, is a big deal because she can use all the elements. Tai Chi is curious and wants to know what elements he can use, but Lemia can't tell him. She explains that he's not a mage, he's a sorcerer. Sorcerers don't use magic spells like mages do. Instead, they use the spirits themselves, not just their borrowed power. But to do that, they have to make a special pact with the spirits. The power from this pact is way stronger than anything a mage can do. Lemia doesn't mess around with their training. She's in charge of Tai Chi, and she's super tough on him. But in the middle of it all, Tai Chi hears some words of encouragement from a voice he doesn't recognize, and it lifts his spirits. Meanwhile, Muller is teaching Rin how to do magic, specifically making fire. Rin surprises Muller because she's really quick at learning it. Muller is happy that she's catching on fast, and Rin even comes up with a new spell. Magic is all about using your imagination, and Rin, with her scientific knowledge, makes blue flames, which is something nobody has done before. Tai Chi is totally wiped out from training, unlike Rin, who's still full of energy. She tries to help him practice, but once again, Tai Chi hears that mysterious voice, and it guides him in getting better with his powers. He's a bit confused because he's the only one who can hear it, but he doesn't think about it for too long. After all the training, they decide it's time to eat. Lemia decides to let Muller keep training Rin, but she tells Tai Chi he can't learn spells just yet. She says he needs to get stronger physically and learn how to fight before he can discover his elemental powers. Muller finds Lemia thinking outside the house while Tai Chi and Rin take a nap. Both women are a bit suspicious of the kid's super strong powers, but they decide to train them for three weeks so they can become independent adventurers. Lemia really wants to keep their special abilities a secret because of what's going on in the country. Sometime later, after three weeks pass, Tai Chi has adapted more to this world. 
He faces a big wolf and shows that he's better at controlling his powers now. He beats the wolf pretty easily. Rin, on the other hand, fights a bunch of horned hares with her impressive skill and power. She's so good that she even uses three different elements to beat the enemies. Lemia and Muller are super impressed, watching from far away. But their attention gets grabbed when an obsidian horse shows up. Muller wants to go help because it's dangerous, but Lemia stops her. She wants to see how good Rin and Tai Chi are at defending themselves. The main characters are feeling pretty confident with their new powers, and they manage to defeat the horse without much trouble. Lemia throws a big celebration because Tai Chi and Rin have passed their graduation exam and now they're ready to head to Aspire to become official adventurers. But it's also a bit sad because it's the last time they'll be seeing each other so often. During the celebration, Lemia drops a bombshell on them. She tells them they're lost ones, which means they came from another world through some kind of weird space-time thing or were summoned by someone. Tai Chi and Rin are super shocked that Lemia knew about this all along. They ask how she found out, and Lemia figures it might have been the latter. Someone used high-level summoning magic to bring them here. But she doesn't know who did it because summoning is super rare and controlled by a magician who deals with time and space. So, they have to find this person and ask why they got brought to this world. Tai Chi is all excited because summoners are super rare, so he thinks it'll be easier to find the person who did it. Later that night, even though Tai Chi and Rin are sad that it's their last day with Lemia and Muller, they know they have to move forward and figure out why they're here. They make a promise to stick together on this quest to find the summoner. But there's something strange happening with Tai Chi. He keeps hearing the voice of a young girl who whispers things to him. She says they'll reunite soon and seems really excited about it. One night, Tai Chi has a dream. He's in a green meadow, and that familiar voice is back, telling him they'll meet soon and asking him to be patient. Just when he's trying to figure out who this mysterious voice is, he wakes up, all sweaty. He's been having this dream ever since he arrived in this world. Skipping ahead a couple of weeks, they are both settled in Aspire, where they registered with the Adventurers Guild. They meet the people who saved them at the start, but they're still low-ranking adventurers, so their jobs are simple, like helping with farming or doing some heavy lifting. They're slowly getting used to this new place and the way things work here. Rin likes to get up early and go to the library to read books for her research. Tai Chi finds her reading in a bar and joins her, kind of interrupting her reading time. Almeta, the waitress, brings them breakfast and a letter from the guild. The letter says they've been summoned, so they head to the guild right away, worried about why they're needed so urgently. This time, they get a job at a slum inn. They have to talk to the customers and the staff to find out about some stolen goods coming into the city through the slums. Rin sees that the contract has two crosses on it, which means it failed twice already. If they mess up, it'll get passed to higher-ranked adventurers. Gerard tells them that they got this job because Lemia said they're super strong. Plus, if they finish it, they'll level up in their adventurer rank. They're totally on board because moving up means better jobs than just cleaning stuff or moving rocks. When they leave the guild, they talk about how far they've come. But then, Rin sees her favorite fruit and goes to buy it. But the price has gone way up since last week, when it was way cheaper. The seller sadly explains that there's not much food coming in lately, which is making everything harder to get, like meat, clothes, and fruits. Prices are way high. And there are even rumors that monsters and wild beasts are attacking the carts that bring stuff. They're hoping for a solution soon. Even though it's pricey, they decide to get some of Rin's favorite fruit to help the vendor out. Both Tai Chi and Rin are worried about the news they heard. They even start thinking that the food missing from the carts might be ending up in the slums, which could be connected to their mission. While they talk about this, there's someone in a cloak watching them from the crowd. As the evening comes, they head to the inn in the slums. At first, nobody takes them seriously because they're dressed all fancy. They look around and see that the inn has drinks and food that you can't find in the regular market because of the cart attacks. Tai Chi doesn't waste any time and asks the waiter straight up about these products. Rin wants to know the truth because they see a chance to make some big money by getting these goods and selling them for a huge profit. Rin even shows the waiter a big bag of coins to see if that gets his attention and makes him spill the beans. This is all a setup. But instead of getting any helpful info, the greedy customers in the inn try to attack them. But Tai Chi and Rin easily take care of them. After that, they kind of scare the customers into talking. The customers spill the beans and say that a guy they met in the pub had invited them to a job, promising it was good. But when they got there, they found out there had already been an attack, and all that was left was the wagon and the stuff inside. They grabbed what they could carry and left the rest at the town's entrance. Tai Chi is making sure they're not lying when the bartender butts in. He admits they only got the stolen stuff, which is normally sold around there. 
He warns them not to ask more questions because it's against the rules and tells them they should leave. Feeling kinda defeated, Tai Chi and Rin start walking in the dark streets of the slums, but then they already sense they'd been followed since that morning. They lure out the enemy and end up getting cornered by three assassins, who turn out to be women. Tai Chi sees this as a chance to get more info if they beat these women, so he decides to fight seriously, but he's still holding back his power. Tai Chi takes down one of the assassins right away, and then Rin deals with the other one. As they're about to face the last assassin, the first one throws a smoke bomb, which gives them enough time to run away, but they leave behind one of their own, who Tai Chi knocked out. Now they're even more curious about this mission because hiring assassins to go after them means someone really doesn't want them looking into those card attacks. Tai Chi and Rin decide to bring the captured assassin to the guild for questioning. They lock her in a cell, tied to a chair. When she wakes up, Gerard is the first to talk to her. He tells her that they brought her here secretly, so she doesn't need to worry about her old buddies coming after her to keep her quiet. But she should think about why Tai Chi decided to let her live. After their mission is all done, Tai Chi and Rin get a promotion in their rank. Muller comes to visit them at the guild to say congrats. They take this chance to fill her in on what's still happening. Even though they finished the mission, prices are still going up. Muller suggests they team up and promises to get Rin her favorite fruits without any trouble. Before they head out as a team, Muller explains that crops ready to be harvested are getting stolen up in the northwest. And that's why prices are going up. Plus, these thieves are being protected by a really skilled mage, so it's tough for the farmers to stop them. The guild now has a big job. They have to watch over the fields, catch the thieves and the mage to get a cool reward. Tai Chi and Rin are pretty interested in this mission, so they decide to join Muller. As they're on their way, Muller feels really happy to have them along. Elves are usually serious and strict, so people don't really want to hang out with them. That means Muller has to do everything on her own most of the time. So, she's really glad to have a team now. When they get to the crop fields, the farmers are super relieved to see them. They're happy that someone's here to protect their crops and catch those pesky thieves. Tai Chi shakes hands with Kasim, the one who asked for help. But Tai Chi has this feeling that something's not quite right about him, even though he can't put his finger on it. The farmers show them around the fields to help them get to know the place. Suddenly, Rin's staff starts warning her about a big danger coming their way. At first, they think it's the thieves, but then they see it's way scarier. Huge ogres and some orcs are coming out of the fruit trees. The group doesn't waste any time and gets ready to defend themselves. Tai Chi and Muller get ready to fight, while Rin focuses on protecting everyone. Muller takes out the orcs easily, and Tai Chi faces off against the big ogre. He uses 35% of his power and delivers a huge punch that takes down the ogre. Kasim, on the other hand, is just watching the whole thing taking notes, but he seems suspicious. When night comes, the group gathers to talk about what just happened. Rin read that ogres and orcs don't usually hang out in these forests, and Muller agrees. They don't want to jump to conclusions, but they think maybe their enemies sent these creatures. All they can do now is wait to see how their enemies react to what just went down. Tai Chi and Rin suggest setting traps to catch the enemy faster, and Muller agrees. Then, the scene changes to something more creepy. There are a bunch of dead bodies in what looks like a forest. A lady is absorbing the energy from the dead bodies into a weird orb. She's planning to feed it to something. She puts on an invisibility cloak and gets ready to go after Tai Chi's group soon. The captured assassin is thinking about why Tai Chi spared her life. Instead of clapping her, he decided to let her live and even kept her buddies in the dark about her, so she wouldn't get clapped. Gerard comes into her cell and interrupts her thoughts. He wants to know if she's ready to help out by giving them the info they need. While they're out patrolling around the crop fields, Muller sees some human footprints on the ground. They follow the prince and end up finding a pile of burnt wood, which tells them the thieves camped there not too long ago because the campfire is still warm. Rin uses her magic to sense that there are three humans nearby. They follow the trail and find the guys in the middle of stealing fruit. There's no sign of their mage with them or close by. They easily beat the guys, tie them up, and then the guys start complaining that they lost because their mage was a no-show today. Kasim says congrats to the adventurers and shakes Tai Chi's hand again. Tai Chi holds onto his hand a bit longer and says that Kasim has really soft hands. Kasim is confused and says it's because he's the boss and doesn't do heavy work. But Muller and Rin aren't satisfied with Kasim's answers. They wonder how he knows so much about ogres and orcs in an area where they don't normally hang out. Usually, only adventurers have that kind of knowledge. Kasim starts to feel trapped and then laughs like a bad guy in a movie. He admits to everything, 
The whole plan with ogres and orcs attacking and the stolen fruits were just a trick to get the adventurers' attention and test their skills as well. All of a sudden, Grammy, the mage we heard about earlier, shows up and takes off her invisibility cloak. She's Kasim's partner in crime. The adventurers get ready for a fight. Grammy focuses on Muller and Rin, while Kasim goes after Tai Chi. Muller realizes they're up against a crazy opponent who gets a kick out of fighting and risking her life. Rin holds her own against Grammy until Muller gets her strength back. Grammy is all excited as Rin uses her different elemental magic on her. On the other hand, Tai Chi finds out that Kasim is a mage and he has summoned a big creature to fight for him. It's a tough opponent and Tai Chi can't really hurt the frosty elemental beast that Kasim summoned, but the beast can hurt him. It's like he's stuck in a tough spot. The adventurers are having a hard time with these foes, who are not only strong but also super tricky. Muller is back in action and goes after Grammy, but Grammy is just as good as she is in sword combat. Rin tries to help but has to stop her spells early to avoid hitting Muller. Grammy is loving every minute of this fight and takes out Muller and Rin without breaking a sweat. Meanwhile, Tai Chi is still struggling against that icy beast. He can't hurt it, so he's just focused on not getting hurt himself. Kasim points out that Tai Chi doesn't have the fire element like Muller and Rin do, so he can't win. Things get even worse when Kasim reveals a red orb. He got it from Grammy who drained vitality from other people into the orb. He feeds it to his summoned creature, and it gets three times bigger and more powerful. The beast gets faster and manages to hurt Tai Chi, making him weaker. Kasim starts talking like a typical bad guy, explaining his plan. He wants to steal Tai Chi's power and is going to use Muller and Rin as hostages. If Tai Chi doesn't do what he says, he'll hand them over to some bad people who will do terrible things to them. Exhausted, Muller and Rin get overwhelmed by Grammy's power. But then something surprising happens. They stand up again, looking like they're not as tired from the battle. It turns out this was all a test to make them better at fighting and to see how good Grammy was. Now they fight back, and it's Grammy who's having a tough time dealing with their new fighting moves. Rin has this lightning sword thing she used on Grammy. Muller is countering all of Grammy's attacks, and then Rin uses her science knowledge to make a big tornado explosion that really weakens Grammy. Muller finishes the job and hurts Grammy pretty badly. She gives up but warns them that she'll come back stronger after she gets better from her injuries. They are happy about their victory, but it doesn't last long. Kasim shows up and tells them to surrender. He says if they don't, he'll clap Tai Chi, who is hurt and unconscious. Now Tai Chi is the one in trouble. He feels frustrated because he promised to protect Rin and go back to their world together, but now he has to watch them become hostages of Kasim. It's really overwhelming, and he closes his eyes. In his dreamlike state, he sees a strange green light and hears the voice he's been hearing for days. It asks him if he wants power, and even though there might be consequences for giving the power to him sooner, Tai Chi still says yes. The voice introduces itself as Ariel, the spirit of the wind. Before Tai Chi wakes up, he sees the light turning into a lady silhouette. When Tai Chi wakes up, he surprises everyone, especially Kasim. He stands up and looks like he's not even hurt. The big creature charges at him swatting him away but he's not hurt. Kasim gets really desperate and tells the creature to attack again. But Tai Chi easily stops its attacks and makes it disappear using his wind power. Kasim and Grammy realize they're in big trouble and try to run away. But Tai Chi's borrowed power can only do so much, and he's super weak now. Even so, he manages to launch an attack that cuts off Kasim's arm before he collapses. Kasim and Grammy manage to escape, but Grammy seems excited about what's happening. After waking up at Lemia's house, Tai Chi learns that he was unconscious for a week because he used up all his magic in the fight. Rin and Muller had brought him there after he didn't wake up for three days. Lemia takes care of him and feeds him to help him recover. She tells him to thank Rin and Muller for taking care of him. Tai Chi and Lemia talk about what happened in the forest. Lemia figures out that the beast was so strong because of the orb which is called the Crimson Pact, a really bad curse that makes things way more powerful. Tai Chi also mentions that he got help from a voice named Ariel, which surprises Lemia. She tells him they can now figure out what kind of sorcerer he is. Kasim reports to his boss, a mysterious figure named Ladra, about what happened during his mission. Despite the arm loss he suffered, Ladra is happy with the information Kasim gathered. Now, Ladra needs Grammy's help for Kasim's next mission. He marks Grammy with a spider-shaped tattoo on her hand to control her. Then, some girls came in to remind him that the festival was starting. Ladra then left an invitation on a pile of paper before leaving. 
Lemia explains to Tai Chi that he's a summoner, which means he can make pacts with specific spirits to gain access to even more powerful spells. This information confuses Tai Chi, but it helps him understand who Ariel is. After speaking with Almeta, he decides to look for Muller or Rin to let them know he's awake. On his way, he intervenes in a situation where two men are bothering a woman. The woman uses his arrival as an opportunity to pretend he was the person she was waiting for. Tai Chi scares off the men, but he realizes that the woman isn't actually in danger as she easily escaped from them. She introduces herself as Anastasia, the former assassin whom Tai Chi had captured in the slums earlier. She now works for the guild and is involved in the investigation into the thefts. Anastasia and Tai Chi head to a manor linked to the thefts, and they engage in a fight, defeating the inhabitants present. While searching for useful information, Tai Chi finds the invitation left behind by Lord Ren Kasim. In the evening, Muller and Rin were walking in the market. They had just finished an important job. Muller could see that Rin was worried about Tai Chi, but Rin said Tai Chi would be okay, and they needed to focus on their task. While they were in the market, some people were arguing about prices going up. Muller and Rin felt like someone was following them. They tried to trick the person following them, but the person attacked them right away. This caused a big commotion in the market. As they were fighting the first attacker, they realized there were three more people helping the first one. So, it became two against four. But then, out of nowhere, Grammy showed up with her invisibility cloak. Grammy knocked out Muller and took her away, saying she didn't like doing it, but her leader had ordered her to. Rin tried to follow Grammy, but the other four attackers stopped her. They had to make sure Grammy could escape with Muller, so they kept Rin from chasing Grammy. It was a tough situation for Rin. Meanwhile, Anastasia and Tai Chi found themselves in dark underground tunnels. The invitation stated that beneath the city of Aspire, there are lots of goblins imbued with the Crimson Pact. They knew they had to stop the goblins from reaching the city. Anastasia opened the door with a pin to make sure it wasn't trapped. Tai Chi then told her that when he had captured her, he had hoped she could live a normal life and was not happy that she was now working for the guild. But he still thanked her for helping, and she felt really touched. She told him to call her Anna, showing that they were becoming closer as friends. Meanwhile, Rin is still having a hard time with her situation. She got pretty annoyed and decided to use her special powers to defeat the people who were causing trouble for her. After that, she got a big surprise. Grammy showed up, and it turned out she wasn't there to fight Rin, at least not today. Grammy's boss had plans to use the Crimson Pact on Muller, and Grammy didn't agree with it. She thought of Rin and Muller as her prey and wanted to be the one to defeat them. Grammy gave Rin the exact location to go to, and they both shared a common goal. Rin didn't waste any time. She hurried to the tower where Muller was held captive. When she arrived, she saw Muller in the middle of a red circle, surrounded by mages who were planning to use her as a sacrifice. Rin acted quickly, using her powers to immobilize the mages and stop the ritual. She rescued Muller just in time. However, their relief was short-lived. Ladra and Kasim suddenly appeared. Ladra had anticipated that Grammy would provide the location. He didn't want to fight and was only there to deliver a grim message. He told them that an army of 3,000 monsters with the Crimson Pact was about to invade the city, destroying everything in their path. To make matters worse, Tai Chi was somewhere else and had no idea about the impending danger. Truly the information they had found in the mansion had indeed been a trap. Anastasia reached a door and accidentally stepped into a red magic circle that summons a powerful golem. Their situation had become even more dire. Kasim appeared uneasy with his boss's decision to attack the city both from within and without. However, Ladra remained resolute, insisting that these were sacrifices they had to make to accomplish their main mission. Meanwhile, Tai Chi and Anastasia faced the powerful golem that had nearly taken her life. Tai Chi intervened just in time and used his powers to defeat the golem. What surprised them was that this golem had no core, which was very unusual because all golems typically had one. Suddenly, the voice of a girl echoed in the room, and another door opened, revealing a chamber filled with goblin eggs. Two young twin girls happily called it Milo and Milo's room. Meanwhile, Muller and Rin wasted no time and informed Gerard about the impending attack. Gerard immediately called a meeting of all adventurers and guards in Aspire. He was deeply concerned because the city's resources were scarce, making it impossible to withstand a siege. This dire situation resulted from the monsters' well-planned attacks on the caravans. Although Gerard hoped Tai Chi would be with them, Muller and Rin assure him that they, along with the guild adventurers, would do their best to protect the city. Lemia joined their discussion, revealing that she had sensed a strong magical power and decided to head to the city, fearing the worst. She offered to stand in for Tai Chi in his absence, further solidifying their resolve to defend Aspire. 
Tai Chi is with the two girls who proudly told him they made the special room and the big golem meaning they are earth mages. They were there to free the goblins who had been given orders to do bad things to women and eat kids and men. Tai Chi tried to convince them to stop because it would affect them too, but the girls showed him a shiny orb they'd used to control the goblins. Without waiting, the girls woke up the goblins, and the goblins were super strong thanks to the Crimson Pact. Tai Chi has to fight them, and he tells Anastasia to stay safe while he handles the goblins. Tai Chi beats the goblins, but he doesn't use all his power because he doesn't want to break the room they are in. But no matter how many goblins Tai Chi beat, the girls just kept waking up more. They thought the goblins wouldn't hurt them because they had the orb. But the goblins tried to attack the girls, and oops, they broke the orb. Tai Chi had to protect the girls now. He asked them how many goblins were out there, but they couldn't say because the goblins were all over the city. Tai Chi put the girls with Anastasia, and they all had to defend themselves from the goblins together. Tai Chi had a big job to protect those three girls, no matter what. Back at the guild, everyone, including the guards, are worried about their tough situation. An external guard brought news that the northern stronghold had fallen to the monsters. Now, their guild and guard team had only 180 members, while they were up against a massive horde of 3,000 monsters. Things got even trickier because Lemia needed to use her tactical magic to take out the monsters at the front, but it would use up half of her magical power. But then, Rin had an idea. She remembered something from her old world and suggested using earth, water, and fire magic together to make a big explosion. Even though the others didn't understand the science behind it, they trusted Rin. Everyone got ready at the city's entrance, waiting for the monster's arrival. Rin started her plan, and it worked really well against the first row of monsters. It made everyone amazed, even though it made Rin a bit tired. But she was determined to keep fighting. They all attack the second row of monsters, and Lemia helps a lot by getting rid of most of them. Just when it seemed like they might win, a soldier told Gerard that another group of monsters was coming. These ones were crimson monsters and twice as strong. Right at that moment, Tai Chi showed up with Anastasia and the two girls, Milo and Milo. As Muller, Lemia, and Rin face the remaining monsters, the girls team up to protect Lemia while she prepares a massive attack. Their plan worked, and they defeated all the monsters, except for three big ones that were really tough. The girls decided to take on one each. Tai Chi, along with Milo and Milo, finally reached the battlefield. However, Rin was in a tough spot. She had used a lot of her magic, and she was too weak to fight her opponent. Her friends were busy dealing with the other big monsters, so they couldn't help her. Rin thought it might be the end for her and wished she could at least thank Tai Chi for everything he'd done. Just when Rin thought she was done for, Tai Chi showed up and saved her from the big monster. Muller rushed to Rin and gave her a big hug, feeling so relieved that she was safe. Tai Chi explains the underground battle to Lemia and asks her to take care of Muller and Rin while he goes after the ogre. He powers up to his full strength and lands a powerful hit on the ogre. Lemia noticed Milo and Milo and asked who they were. Tai Chi tells her they were talented earth mages on their side. He tells them all to work together to defeat the remaining monsters while he gets ready to fight the last two ogres. While all this was happening, Ladra watched and was amazed by Tai Chi's power. But they had planned for this situation ready to disrupt the festival soon enough. They were working for someone who had foreseen all these outcomes. At the guild's headquarters, a soldier arrives with news from the battlefield. Anastasia, who had stayed behind to help the wounded, overheard Gerard talking to the soldier. She is really worried about Tai Chi because he is the only one who has treated her like a person, and not just a tool. He had saved her and given her a chance at a normal life, which she really wanted. But then, a hooded figure cast a spell on her and whispered something in her ear. Anastasia felt compelled to leave everything behind and walk toward the battlefield. The adventurers kept on fighting, using their weapons against the never-ending wave of crimson creatures that showed no sign of stopping. They fought with all their strength to protect the city. Tai Chi, with his power at 100%, managed to defeat each of the ogre leaders, but it drained a lot of his energy. He thought the major threats were gone and took a moment to relax, but that turned out to be a big mistake. The ground suddenly shook, and he had to jump up into the sky to avoid being pulled into a big hole that opened up. Sharp claws came out of the ground and destroyed the ogre's bodies. Lamia gets really worried when she sees what is happening. Then, a two-headed golden dragon emerged from the depths. This surprised Lemia and the others because these dragons usually lived in underground nests and didn't get involved in human fights. But now, they are intervening in their fights. Rin noticed an unfamiliar woman on the battlefield, but she didn't pay too much attention to her. Tai Chi was just as confused by the dragon's presence. Lemia explains that for some reason, this dragon had woken up, even though human wars usually didn't bother them at all. 
Tai Chi knew he had to face this powerful dragon. He tells the others to go back to the city and get ready for evacuation in case things go bad. Rin leaves Milo and Milo with Muller, but Rin decides to stay with Tai Chi and help him in the battle. Tai Chi is glad to have his best friend by his side, but he tells Rin not to fight because he doesn't want to hurt her when he uses his full power. Tai Chi goes up to the dragon to fight it, hoping to use aerial power, but she doesn't answer. He has no choice but to fight with his current power. His first attack doesn't work against the dragon. Rin tries to help, but the dragon's other head stops her. She has to stay back. Even though Tai Chi is really fast, the dragon hurts him and makes him weak. But Tai Chi notices that the dragon isn't using its full power, which makes him wonder why such a strong creature woke up in the first place. Suddenly, Anastasia comes to where Tai Chi is. She didn't mean to interfere, but when Tai Chi scolds her for being there, she wakes up from her daze. Anastasia says she didn't plan to get involved, but then the dragon's other head gets ready to attack and shoots at them. Tai Chi is hurt and can't move fast enough to get out of the way, but Anastasia pushes him to safety and gets hit instead. She gets really hurt, and despite Tai Chi trying to help, Anastasia dies in his arms. Before she goes, she asks Tai Chi to be her friend and smiles because she's glad to have met someone as kind as him. Feeling desperate, angry, and sad, Tai Chi screams in pain. He's really upset because he couldn't protect Anastasia, even though he promised he wouldn't let her get hurt. He keeps asking for power, even though Ariel isn't responding. But he doesn't give up. He keeps trying until he finally gets her attention. Ariel finally shows up and offers to give him power because his strong feelings are like a command to her. Now, Tai Chi can see Ariel's real form, and she feels really sorry that she couldn't help him before. But there's a rule that spirits can't use their power without orders from the summoner, and Tai Chi is the summoner. They hadn't made a formal agreement before, but she made an exception the first time when Tai Chi was in danger, and Ariel helped him then. Tai Chi realizes he's been scared to use his true power, but now he knows he needs it to protect everyone, especially the people he cares about. So, he decides to make a pact with Ariel. They make the pact official by meeting two conditions. Tai Chi has to tell Ariel to give him power, and he has to be ready to accept it. Tai Chi leaves Anastasia in Rin's care, and now he's full of new power and ready to face the dragons once more. The dragons are impressed by his strength and determination. When Tai Chi asks why they're here and what he needs to do for them to leave, they say they'll answer his questions if he shows them his true power. Tai Chi agrees, and the dragons get serious. Both dragon heads attack Tai Chi with all their might. But Tai Chi, using his amazing power, not only defends himself but also hits the dragons back. The dragons seem happy with how things turned out. They tell him more, saying they were sent by someone who wanted to make Tai Chi use his power. Before they go, the dragons give Tai Chi a warning. They say this person will guide him, so he has to get even stronger. They explain that what happened today was important for their world, and then they left. Wadra goes back to talk to a woman seated behind a veil. It turns out that Tai Chi passed the test they had set up for him. Now, all that's left is to keep guiding him. Some time passed since the monster invasion and the big fight. Aspire slowly got back to normal. There weren't any more monster attacks on the goods carriages, and prices went back to normal too. This was a small comfort for all the people who had lost someone during the attack to show they didn't fight in vain. Tai Chi often went to visit Anastasia's grave. He'd leave flowers and talk to her a bit. Back at Lemmy's house, Tai Chi summons Ariel to show his powers to his friends. They were having a nice conversation when they saw a royal carriage coming their way. It turned out to be a messenger from King Gilmer, named Elsina. She says the king wanted them to come to the capital, Wenefix, because they needed their help. Since the king had called them, they didn't really have a choice but to go. They all got in the royal carriage, and on the way, they learned about the problem happening in the palace. For the past 30 years, the magical kingdom of Alistain had been run by two factions. One group supported King Gilmer, and the other group supported his younger brother, Duke Dordesheim. King Gilmer got his power legally and has been talking with other countries, working together with them to build relationships. So, the king lent out their magicians to other nations, but his younger brother didn't like that. The duke was more old-fashioned and didn't want to share their magic knowledge or work with other countries. He thought it would make Alistain weaker. The duke decided to rebel, and that will lead to a big war soon. So, King Gilmer asked Tai Chi and his friends for help. When they finally got to the capital city, Wenefix, they were surprised. It was really different from Aspire. It looked really fancy, but there were hardly any people around. The few people they did see ran inside their houses as soon as they saw them. Lemia was acting suspiciously and asked Alcina questions about the king's reason for wanting to meet Rin and Tai Chi. But Alcina just said it's nothing and the king just wanted to see both of them. 
she seemed nervous, and then suddenly, an arrow came at them out of nowhere. But because they were really alert, they dodged it and saved Elsina too. The soldier who's supposed to get rid of the group tells his boss, Duke Dordesheim, that they didn't succeed. The group, along with Elsina, gets to the castle. When they go into the royal hall, they see that the officials there are giving them mean looks. Elsina introduces them to Bella, who's the top magic person for the king, and General Sumela, who's in charge of the king's army. Charlotte, the king's daughter, is there too. Finally, the king comes in, and everyone is being really polite and respectful, except for Lemia. Lemia wants the king to be clear and not beat around the bush. This surprises everyone in the room because she's being so bold. The king tells Sumela and Bella to take the group out of the room. It seems like the king and Lemia know each other, so they don't have to be all formal. Lemia plans to help the king if he agrees to some things she wants. The king says yes, and he tells Elsina to handle the rest. But before she leaves, Lemia wants the king to tell the truth about why he summoned Tai Chi and Rin. He says he did it because he needed their super strong power to stop the rebellion, and he says he's sorry. Tai Chi is really not happy with the king. He thinks it's selfish of the king to bring them from their peaceful world where there were no wars or clappings and make them fight for him. But at this point, there's not much they can do, and the king says he'll take all the blame. The group is taken to their rooms where they'll stay. Rin is in Tai Chi's room, and they're talking about how they feel about the king. Then, Elsina comes to their door and says someone wants to talk to them. It turns out to be Princess Charlotte. She says she's really sorry and that she's the one who summoned them to this world. She explains everything, firstly telling them that she can do magic with time and space. She feels really bad for dropping them in a place with monsters and taking a while to find them. Alcina tries to say it was the king's idea, but the princess says that even though she had doubts, she wanted to protect their people and their country just like her father and so accepted to summon them. Princess Charlotte explains that originally, only Tai Chi was supposed to be brought to this world. But her father's brother sent an assassin who messed up the spell, and that's how Rin got brought here too. They ask if there's a way to go back home, but Charlotte says it's not possible, at least not for her. The spell can only be used once in a lifetime, and magicians who can do summoning like Tai Chi are super rare, maybe like one in a million. But Charlotte promises that after they deal with the rebellion and things settle down in the kingdom, she'll find a way to send them back to their world. Tai Chi and Rin aren't mad about it, probably because she's a cute girl, and not an old man, and they trust that she'll keep her word. They've made friends since they got here, and they know she cares about her people, so they want to help end the fighting and go back home when everything is okay. Their talk ends when Lemia tells Tai Chi to meet her outside. Simela sets up a fight with Tai Chi to see how strong he really is. She doesn't hold back and attacks him right away. Lemia suggested the fight because Sumela's soldiers don't trust them, thinking they can't fight. So, Sumela, who's known as the strongest in the realm of physical fighting, goes all out to test Tai Chi. Tai Chi wants to call Ariel for help, but he doesn't. Instead, he starts getting used to the fight and manages to keep up with Sumela, which surprises everyone. He even beats her, and she gives up. She says sorry for the test and then says something really weird. She asks Tai Chi to marry her, or if he already has a wife, she says she could be his second wife. Tai Chi is surprised and nervous, especially when she talks about having three kids, but he immediately says no. Later in the evening, Tai Chi is all alone, so he summons Ariel to show her the pretty views of the kingdom. But Ariel knows something's up and can tell he's not okay. Tai Chi tells her he's scared that he might hurt someone because he's so strong, especially since they're going to be fighting in a war with humans, not monsters. He also worries about Rin having to hurt people and wants her to go back home safely without having to have blood in her hands. Ariel comforts him and makes him feel better. After that, Tai Chi goes to Rin's room because she didn't close the door properly. He accidentally sees her in just her underwear as she comes out of the bath which created an awkward moment at that point. Princess Charlotte is praying again for Tai Chi's safety when she's found by Cardinal Ladra urging her that everything will be okay. But he is behind the monster attack and no one knows about it. The next day, Tai Chi goes to the royal garden and tells Rin that Lemia wants them to join a meeting with the royal army about the war. Rin is busy taking care of the plants that got all dried up because they were ignored. Somewhere else, the duke is talking with his war subordinates about their plans, even though they don't all agree. They leave the battle plan up to Nilgan, and Marchese isn't too happy about it because he wants to get rid of Tai Chi and Rin first. Nilgan thinks they should go to war right away and take control of the kingdom. 
but the duke hopes that Tai Chi and Rin won't mess up their plans. The king is informed that the enemy army is getting ready. King Gilmer tells Sumela and Bella to get the soldiers and mage ready for the battle. Sumela has to explain the battle plan to the group of adventurers. Lamia thinks it might be a trick because the brothers' forces are attacking with only 1,000 soldiers while the kingdom has 3,000. Sumela says they'll be careful just in case. Tai Chi and Rin don't really get what they're talking about because they've never been in a war before. But Muller says they'll be okay if they do what they're told. Tai Chi says it's different from fighting monsters because they'll have to hurt other people. But Lemia reminds them that in this world, it's either clap or be clapped, whether it's people or monsters. After talking about the plan, Tai Chi and Rin are told to rest up because they have to wake up early. Tai Chi goes to see Rin but decides not to talk about what's on his mind. As he's about to leave, Rin stops him and asks if he can stay in her room for the night because she's nervous about the whole situation. She says it feels like the nights before her tennis matches, but now it's war and she doesn't want anyone to die. Even though it's a war, Tai Chi suggests that she shouldn't go into battle since she wasn't originally part of the summoning. But Rin insists, saying that she chose to enter the summoning circle, and now she wants to protect her friends and end the fighting. Muller and Lemia also talk about the upcoming war and how worried they are about Tai Chi and Rin, but their conversation is cut short when Lemia senses someone strange. It's an assassin sent to clap Tai Chi and Rin by Marchies, one of the Duke of Dordesheim's allies who doesn't want Nilgen to get all the credit for the battle. The assassin goes to the room where Tai Chi and Rin are supposed to be and stabs the bed, thinking they're there. But Tai Chi sensed him before, and the group confronts the assassin. He attacks Rin but only manages to cut her hair. That makes Tai Chi really mad, and he goes after the assassin almost like he wants to clap him. All this while, he's not afraid of hurting or dying, but he's scared of losing the people he promised to protect, just like what happened with Anastasia. Lemia stops Tai Chi from hurting the assassin more, thinking they could get some information from him. But it turns out the assassin isn't interested in talking. He frees himself from Tai Chi and bites a suicide pill as he jumps off the balcony, dying right away. The next day, the enemy troops are ready to fight, but so is the kingdom. Tai Chi goes first and uses Ariel to make a big hole in the ground, making the enemy army have to take a longer route to get to them, which makes them easy targets. But Lemia looks worried when she sees that the enemy soldiers don't have much equipment, and maybe they have underestimated their opponents. All the enemy soldiers can use long-range attacks with elemental powers, which surprises everyone because they didn't expect so many of them to be mages. Tai Chi scans and figures out that they're wearing rings, and Lemia explains that these rings have magic stones in them that can do simple spells. But the soldiers are using the rings recklessly, not realizing that the more power they use, the more it takes their life energy, which could end up killing them. The adventurers are determined to prevent their enemies from suffering such a horrible fate, but Sumela's soldiers are reluctant to stop it. They think that if their enemies die without their interference, the battle will be easier. However, Sumela and Bella, the mage, don't want their enemies to die needlessly, so they support the group's plan to stop the life energy consumption from the rings. Lemia comes up with a plan that requires Rin's help. Meanwhile, the enemy soldiers continue to attack, even though most of them are visibly weakened by the energy consumption. Nilgen, their leader, urges them not to give up and to focus their attacks on Rin and the others. Ariel creates a protective barrier to shield them, and Muller defends Rin against any attacks that manage to get through the barrier, allowing Rin to concentrate on her spell. Lemia, along with the other mages, conjures grey clouds to make it rain, and then Rin uses lightning to shock the ground where the weakened enemy soldiers are standing. This causes a massive electrocution that severely weakens all of them. Inimicus, the duke's right-hand man and advisor, arrives and is impressed by Rin's clever strategy. Nilgen desperately asks Inimicus to revive everyone and blames him for giving them the magic stones, claiming it would bring him victory. However, Inimicus stabs Nilgen, deeming him a failure and no longer useful. The battle concludes with the defeat of the enemy soldiers, bringing relief to the entire kingdom. However, Kasim is still frustrated by Tai Chi's praise and shows Grammy a sinister-looking statue, hinting that it will bring about the end of Tai Chi. The next day, Rin visits Tai Chi's chamber to wake him up. When he sees her, he wants to compliment her beauty, but instead, he rushes out of the room to vomit. It turns out he had overeaten the previous day, leading to an indigestion problem. Lemia and Muller also arrive in Tai Chi's room to inform them that King Gilmer has summoned them to the Grand Royal Hall. In front of everyone, King Gilmer congratulates them for their outstanding performance on the battlefield. Charlotte, the princess, expresses her desire to reward them for their bravery. She offers them high-quality weapons and items from the royal house, which they happily accept. 
Each of them selects a weapon that catches their attention the most. Tai Chi is immediately drawn to a katana, and he doesn't hesitate to choose it. The princess explains that the sword wasn't forged in their nation, and the soldiers refuse to use it because of its slim blade. Tai Chi understands that in a world dominated by broadswords and large weapons, a katana might not be the popular choice. However, he believes that owning a katana is every man's dream. So, armed with their selected weapons, Sumela suggests a practice fight with Tai Chi, which Lemia agrees to. Lemia tests out her own ring she got, and the others, seeing the amazing power display, decide to try their weapons too. Sumela's initial main goal is to spar again with her supposed future husband, Tai Chi but he manages to escape as he passes out from Sumela violently shaking him because he still hasn't gotten over his indigestion. In the market, Tai Chi feels many eyes on him, thinking it's because they saw Ariel, and everyone is looking at her. However, apart from Tai Chi, no one else can see her. In reality, they're looking at him because he defended the city the day before. Even children approach him excitedly to meet him and ask to shake his hands. As he's about to return to the training ground, he senses the presence of Kasim, who emerges from the shadows. Tai Chi is surprised to see that Kasim is missing an arm, but Kasim reminds him that he was responsible for that damage, something Tai Chi didn't know because he was blinded by anger at that moment before falling unconscious. Kasim wants to clap Tai Chi and proposes a duel, which Tai Chi wants to avoid so as not to involve the innocent bystanders. But if Tai Chi refuses, Kasim has taken precautions to have poison poured into the capital's well. Tai Chi doesn't have many options but to go with him to a secluded place to fight. On the kingdom's training ground, Rin and Muller were fighting, showing off their new weapons. Lemia talks with General Sumela. General Sumela wanted to calm the soldiers down, so she suggested these practice fights. She heard that the Duke had readied a part of his army, and they might have to leave for battle that very night. Now, in a secluded area, Kasim shows Tai Chi a cursed statue given to him by Ladra, his boss. It was supposed to make their fight more even by lowering Tai Chi's power to Kasim's level, so it'd be a fair match. Kasim said Tai Chi was lucky, not having worked as hard as he did to get strong. So, in their fight, hard work would decide the winner. Ariel tries to stop Tai Chi, worried his power might never return, but Tai Chi agrees to the fight. Ariel was mad and left at first, but then she changed her mind and watched the fight. Kasim had already activated the statues, and now they were fighting each other with punches and magic spells. They both hurt themselves really badly. Kasim thought, this is it, my final attack. Tai Chi was worried, wondering how he could stop it with his own strength. Then he remembers all his training from the past. Tai Chi grabbed his katana and slashed Kasim's attack, sending Kasim flying into the wall. Kasim knew he couldn't win, so he gave up and let Tai Chi go. He tells Tai Chi that he could get his power back by breaking the artifact. All of a sudden, the artifact started glowing and a spooky black ghost came out and attacked Tai Chi. Kasim thought maybe Ladra did something else to it. Tai Chi tried hitting it, but that didn't work at all. He was stuck. Then, out of nowhere, Grammy showed up and defended Tai Chi. She broke the artifact, but the ghosty thing still didn't go away. Tai Chi figured out what to do so he used his massive wind power, and that finally got rid of the weird creature, and he got his powers back. Later, Tai Chi really wanted to chat with Kasim. But Grammy told him that Kasim felt super sorry for underestimating Tai Chi, and now his pride is all broken. Grammy explains that Kasim knew what it took to become strong and really appreciated people who tried hard. Kasim's only regret was not realizing Tai Chi's amazing skills earlier. While Kasim scolded Grammy for saying so much, Tai Chi said he had a super strict teacher who made him who he is today. Grammy helps Kasim stand up to leave. Just as they were about to say bye to Tai Chi, a big commotion happened. There was chaos in the city, and everyone started running and hiding because the rebel army declared war. Ladra talks to his master, Lady Shade, and explains he gave Kasim something to help with his revenge. She said everything was going as planned, and they were ready for the next part of their plan. As everyone gets ready for the big fight, Tai Chi finds Rin. He promised that he'd protect her no matter what, but she made him promise that she'd fight too, and they'd protect each other, which Tai Chi agreed to. As the day begins, everyone gets ready to face the big battle that's gonna decide what happens to the kingdom. The duke is all set to fight his brother to take over the kingdom. He asks Inimicus if their victory is sure, and Inimicus assures him they are gonna win. They got marchies and some tough fighters who will handle the kingdom's mages during the battle while Inimicus has a plan to deal with Tai Chi. King Gilmer talks to all the soldiers. He tells them to stay strong and fight for the kingdom's people. 
they march into battle, and it's super big and really intense. The kingdom's mages help out by taking out some of the bad guys. Tai Chi, using the wind spirit, flies over to the enemy camp to deal with the soldiers there. Now, each adventurer has someone to go up against. Rin fights this hyperactive girl named Suzora, Muller takes on Marchis, who's trying to be all charming, and Lemia, who's called the Mage of the Fallen Leaves, goes against Mist Folos, a powerful mage. Tai Chi goes to talk to the Duke. He says he's a messenger of the king and wants peace. He tells him that both the duke and the king should think about the kingdom's people and not fight. He says if they surrender, the king has promised not to hurt them. But if they don't, Tai Chi can easily take the duke to the king. The duke seems to be thinking about it. And then Inimicus uses some magic to control the unconscious soldiers outside. Lemia, even though it seemed like she was in trouble because of Miss Folo's power, actually comes up with a new spell on the spot. She amazes Miss Folos, who's already hurt from her attack, and then she casts a super big spell to get rid of him for good. Muller, on the other hand, gets really mad at Marchis for making fun of Miss Folos, who was supposed to be his comrade. So, when Marchis disarms her sword, she uses her dagger to take down Marchis, like, she kills him. Now, Tai Chi talks to Dordesheim about peace, but Dordesheim says no. He asks Tai Chi why he doesn't just rule the kingdom with his superpower. But Tai Chi says he doesn't like the royal life or wants to be a dictator and force people to follow him. But Dordesheim is really proud and won't back down. He says he'll do anything to keep the kingdom safe. Then, Ariel sees something weird and tells Tai Chi. Tai Chi and the Duke both see that Inimicus is giving off strange energy. And all the soldiers who fell in battle come back as zombies attacking any and everyone. These berserkers don't care if you're on their side or not. Even in Rin's fight with Suzora, Rin manages to hurt her and get the upper hand. Suzora realizes that Rin is strong, but they get in trouble because of the zombie soldiers. They have to team up to fight these new enemies. The Duke doesn't get what's happening because he didn't know about Inimicus' plan. Finally, Inimicus admits that he messed up the battlefield with magic from the start. He tricked the Duke to start a war because his master told him to. Inimicus is just crazy saying he leaves to please his master, Lady Shade, and he wants to invoke chaos in the world. His body starts materializing as he gives his soul to his supreme being. The Duke feels bad about what is happening and decides to help Tai Chi with the Berserker battle. A long time ago, there was a war known as the Bloody Rhapsody, which started 200 years back because of a border dispute between the Guardian and Scatolith empires. At first, people thought the battle would be over quickly, but it turned out to be a huge deal. The soldiers went crazy, attacking anyone and everyone, including their own allies and regular people. They were filled with this crazy need for blood. It was a really savage war and it's still remembered today because it caused the death of 700,000 people from both sides combined. Lemia tells Muller that all the soldiers under the Duke's command are being controlled by some dark and powerful sorcery from a really bad person who knows black magic. Lemia says the only way to stop this control is to take down the person who started it, or else the soldiers won't stop and will go on a rampage in the cities. Rin and Suzora are fighting together. Rin is trying not to hurt the soldiers, but Suzora is clapping them. Since Suzora is a contract mercenary, Rin decides to hire her to fight alongside her. Suzora agrees and accepts her reward as just making it alive. Rin suggests they go find the others for now and then figure out the next step. Tai Chi is fighting against these berserker soldiers who keep getting back up, no matter what he does. Dordesheim tells him not to hold back and to clap the soldiers he comes across to make sure the same tragedy from years ago doesn't happen again. Sumela, Lemia, and Muller are also fighting with that mindset in their own areas in order to clap the berserkers, even though they know the soldiers are being controlled. They feel like they have to do it to stop innocent people from getting hurt. This is different from what Rin and Tai Chi wanted, which was to use their power to help. But now Tai Chi is ready to do whatever it takes to protect the people he cares about and accepts the Duke's suggestion. But just when Tai Chi is about to follow through and take down the berserkers, Ariel steps in. She admits that she lied about her appearance and the power she gave Tai Chi. Her true power is so crazy strong that it could actually hurt Tai Chi if it's not controlled right. Finally, Ariel understands how determined Tai Chi is to protect the people he loves, so she shows her true form. Rin shows up too, even though her leg is hurt from her fight with Suzora. Tai Chi feels guilty for not being able to protect her earlier, but now that he has the power, he's ready. He calls on his elemental spirit, Sylphid, and this amazing thing happens. The Brisker curse circle disappears and all the soldiers stop being controlled. This is a super unheard of spell because everyone thought the only way to stop the control was to clap the person who started it. Ariel now in her true form and actually named Sylphid, 
turns out to be the queen of all the spirits and has mega power. Tai Chi asks if she's still Ariel, and she tells him they're both the same person, Ariel and Silphid. Tai Chi is super relieved now. The big, scary berserkers are gone, but there's still a big problem. Inimicus had turned into a huge monster after offering his soul to the lady shade he worships and gained a new power from her. Inimicus says this lady made all the events that happened to Tai Chi since he arrived. The princess was just a pawn in this game. Tai Chi is supposed to be like a sword and a shield for this lady according to Inimicus, but he doesn't know who she is, and Inimicus won't tell him. So, they start fighting, and even though Inimicus looks really scary, Tai Chi is super strong. He's mad because he was used as a tool for someone who wanted to start a war and hurt innocent people. Tai Chi keeps punching Inimicus till Inimicus is weakened. Inimicus asks Tai Chi to clap him but says Tai Chi can't clap another person, and that is his weakness. But Tai Chi throwing away his humanity decides he has to do it to protect the people he loves. So, he ends Inimicus's life, and Inimicus is happy because he did what his master, Lady Shade, wanted. The big war is all done, and the kingdom's streets are filled with happy people celebrating the win. Tai Chi used so much magic that he fainted after the fight and has been resting for days now. Lemia comes to see him, tells him to rest, and thanks him for stopping the war. The princess comes rushing in too, and Lemia teases the other girls for overworrying even though she said Tai Chi just needs a few days to get better. The war messed things up for both sides, but now the streets are lively again, and Wenifix's capital is getting back to normal. Tai Chi and his group become advisors to the kingdom as their reward, as well as lots of money for doing a great job. They're also part of a special army team that can be summoned whenever the kingdom is in trouble. But not everything's happy because King Gilmer has to punish his brother, the Duke, for betraying them. Tai Chi doesn't feel super happy about everything, but Lemia tells him that he did the right thing. Sometimes, you have to make tough choices even if they hurt, and feeling that hurt makes you human. The adventurers go back to Aspire after saying goodbye to the princess, who promises to keep finding a way to send them back home. On their way back, Tai Chi promises himself to use his new power to protect his friends and find out who that mysterious lady Inimicus talked about. They're all pretty tired from the battle that happened in Wenifix, but when they get back to Aspire, the city is all decorated with lanterns. Muller and Lemia tell them it's the Starry Night Festival, a special event where the living and the dead get together. Legend says that on this day, the gates to the land of the dead open up, and the spirits of the people who passed away come back to visit. They take on their old looks, and the lanterns help them find their way to remember their lives or see their loved ones. But it's not all just pretty and nice. You have to buy these special amulets to protect yourself from getting possessed or hurt by the dead spirits. It's a tradition. But here's the twist, the amulets are actually masks that hide your real face. Both the living and the dead wear masks, so nobody can tell who's who. Families of the folks who passed away leave masks at their graves, and the spirits wear those masks. Since every mask is different, that's how everyone knows who's who at the festival. Tai Chi buys a mask for the tradition and tells Rin about Anastasia while leaving the mask on her grave, hoping to see her one more time. Muller and Lemia see that the guild has a soup stand to celebrate the day. Muller gets upset when she finds out the soups have aphrodisiac ingredients because she thinks it's not right to encourage naughty behavior. Rin and Tai Chi, curious about the commotion, ask what's going on, and she explains everything. She suggests selling something more fitting but yummy for the day and asks Rin and Tai Chi who mentioned their world had a similar tradition, what kind of food they had during their festival. After thinking for a bit, Tai Chi comes up with an idea, they'll sell shaved ice. They go through all the steps, and everybody wants to try it. They really like it because it's a cool and new treat in that world. Then, the ladies leave Tai Chi with Gerard and Marie at the stall, saying they have other jobs to do during the festival since they're fire magicians. Tai Chi puts Gerard in charge of scraping the ice in case they get more customers. Soon enough, the group of adventurers who saved him on the first day shows up. They're really happy to see how much Tai Chi has improved and also meet his wind spirit, Sylphie. Just when things are getting fun, Tai Chi's friends arrive, looking all dressed up for the festival and stealing the spotlight. Everybody can see that something special might be happening between Tai Chi and Rin, and they encourage it. But then, a storm shows up out of nowhere and threatens to mess things up. It looks like the festival might get cancelled because of it. Tai Chi says no way, since this event only happens once a year and lets people see their families again. He won't let it be ruined. 
With Lemmy's permission, he uses his power to summon a strong wind and blow away the dark clouds. It actually works, and the festival keeps going, but they only have red fireworks. Rin using her science knowledge decides to make colorful fireworks with Muller, making the party even better. When it's time for a dance, everyone finds a partner. Lemia takes over the stall for Tai Chi and tells him to ask Rin for a dance. Tai Chi picks Rin, and they dance together for a while. But during the last dance, he sees Anastasia on the sidewalk wearing the mask he left on her grave, and he's stunned. Rin notices how he feels and brings him closer so they can dance together. After that, Rin steps aside, and now Muller is his dance partner. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.